Okay, we're, so we're starting this session that we're going to talk about celebrities and drivers. You're going to show some pics um, that you still have on the computer, but more so we're going to hit memorabilia around the house. So go ahead and show that that pace car shot here. And what That's in 1978. Who, who's this in is, that car? This is actually 1977. They had a, a press unveiling for the uh, pace car in 1977 in uh, October of 77. And they did a thing out on the golf course with uh, Tony Holman, that's who's in the car, that's Tony showing Holman. off the pace car. Okay. And this was taken 10 days. This was the last picture that I ever took of Tony Holman uh, 10 days before his death in October of uh, 77. Wow. So that was right. Right before Tony passed away. Let's get a close-up shot of that. Okay. In 1986, Corvette was again the pace car uh, for the second running, and the pace car driver was one of my all-time heroes. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, my dad was in the Army Air Corps, and this is uh, General... Uh, Chuck Yeager, the first man to break the sound barrier in a plane, and he drove the pace car in that particular year, and I got to meet him. And as a matter of fact, a couple of years later, I'm uh, shooting a race in Phoenix, and we took some drivers to a local establishment uh, to sign autographs. And when I walked into the place, I hear somebody calling my name. Now, I'm... Uh, 2,000 miles away from home, and somebody's calling my name, and I don't recognize the voice, and I look around, it's Chuck Yeager. And when I was done shooting the autograph session for the drivers, uh, Chuck invited me to come over to his table and and sit and have a drink with him. That's and that was kind of a thrill. That's great. During my last Ten years uh, working at the Speedway, and uh, on race day, I would get to shoot the celebrity flag waver, and anybody from Richie, uh, excuse me, Reggie Miller of the Pacers, Peyton Manning of the Colts, uh, Sugar Ray Leonard, Christy Yamaguchi, uh, a ton of celebrities came through that flag stand and I got to take pictures and get to know him a little bit for a couple hours before the race. I'd always give him a safety talk of two things that couldn't do. Don't drop the flag. Don't hit the photographer. As you can see in my position right there, I'm getting ready to shoot Jack right before the start of the race. Now I stand on a box and I shoot towards uh, the celebrity flag waver and they do their flag waving and as the cars go underneath the, the flag stand and I try to get the uh, celebrity waving the flag and the, a couple of cars in the picture. Only one celebrity ever hit the photographer and it's Jack Nicholson. And when he did it, he did it on purpose. He didn't hit me hard, but he hit me hard enough I felt it. And he looked at me and smiled. So I knew he did it on purpose. This was the year, I think it was 2009, that uh, Elio Castro Nevis was uh, on Dancing with the Stars and actually won the Dancing with the Stars and won the, the Big Ball Trophy. Uh, this is with his uh, partner on the show that uh, came to the speedway and danced across the bricks. And I was out there taking pictures of this happening. And in the background, you see the sign that says, uh, uh, vote for Elio. And this is obviously the only time some of the one dancing with the stars also won the Indianapolis 500. And you took the shot of them on the bricks. Yeah, exactly. And there are some disco balls. If we look above right. them. That was hanging from the flag stand. And we, I don't know where they came up with those, but they got it for the shoot, the, the session. And I think I was, I think I was the only photographer out there when that happened. <laughs> That's pretty neat. We sent that photo to People Magazine, Us Magazine, several of the celebrity uh, oriented or, or Hollywood oriented magazines. And they, 
uh, it showed up in a few magazines. That's great. Several times I got to meet celebrities at, at racetracks. Uh, when we get to the, the hallway and some of the pictures, I'll show you. But this, this was at Long Beach. And I walk up, I knew the gentleman here on the left, uh, Cecil Taylor, and he was with AJ Foyt Racing. And I went, I went up to talk to Cecil. Cecil introduced me to a uh, country music icon, Dwight Yoakam. And, oh, yeah, I've definitely heard of Dwight Yoakam, uh, yeah. So I was explaining some of the in intricacies as well as Cecil was doing the same thing of uh, being in the pits and some safety issues uh, to Dwight. And when you th when did you say this was? In the I 80s. In the 80s. 80s. All right. It's when he had hair. <laughs> in late 2000s, I think like 2009, 2010, one of our races was held in Brazil. And going to Sao Paulo, Brazil, there was one thing I had to go see when I was had a, a part of a day off. And that was uh, where Ayrton Senna was buried in uh, a graveyard in Brazil in South America. He so was explain a, to people what that background, his background Okay. Is. Ayrton was a three-time world champion in Formula One. I got to know Ayrton in uh, the many races that I shot in, in Formula One. And uh, kind of a funny story, uh, I happened to be in a restroom when Ayrton walked in and I'm standing there and doing my business and I had probably three cameras around my neck and as I turned to walk away, I recognized what he, who he was and he was in the stall next to me and I turned around and I walked out and while, after I walked out, he walked out and he looked at me and he says, stuck his hand out, hand out and introduced himself and he says, I want to thank you for not taking a picture of me in there doing my business. I said, I don't work like that, so no problem. So we got to talking and I mentioned that I was uh, at the Detroit Grand Prix and was chief photographer there and and, uh, yeah, name the, the name of the different tracks. Uh, I was Penske. chief photographer at, at the one Dallas. Uh, I did Montreal, but I didn't do anything officially there. Okay. Uh, I did Detroit Grand Prix for several years, both in Formula One and IndyCar. Uh, I did Phoenix a couple of years, the Phoenix Grand Prix. Um I've, I've seen quite a few Grand Prix races, and I got to know a few of the drivers. That's where I met Emerson Fittipaldi. Okay. Okay. All right, let's go on to the next. Okay. Uh, on the flag stand, I've got to meet several, uh, well, in racing, I've got to meet several celebrities, and one of them is a, uh, a war hero from the Vietnam War, uh, Colonel... Bruce Crandall, and he was a Medal of Honor winner during the Vietnam War. Uh, there was actually a movie uh, filmed about him, and I, I can't recall the movie, but uh, it may be up there on his... No, it's not. But, but anyway, he was a Medal of Honor winner and somebody that I really respected, being a, an Army veteran myself. Okay. And when, where did you serve again? Uh, I served in the uh, o Okinawa, in Okinawa during the Vietnam War. Uh, I was a motorcycle policeman, uh, an armed forces policeman uh, for a year and a half on the island of Okinawa. Okay. Go. At St. Louis, uh, the racetrack in Gateway, or at Gateway, I got to meet Red Shandies, another one of my heroes from baseball. Uh, a Hall of Famer from the St. Louis Cardinals. And is that uh, Jay Leno? And Jay Leno and Jeff Gordon uh, during a Brickyard photo shoot for the pace car. And Jay Leno was a pace car driver that year. Uh, and it was uh, sent to me by the Chevrolet people who I, I did a lot of work for. Uh, 
as director of photography at the racetrack and after. And how do you think Jeff Gordon is in that shot? It looks like he's still pretty young. Um, no, Jeff was, uh, at least towards the end of my career, uh, he was uh, there. He was a Chevrolet driver, and they brought him in to, to help with Jay Leno. Okay. He he showed Jay the way around the track in that car. I'm sure Jay wanted to show him too, right? Right. I bet. This was at Michigan International Speedway. The Grand Marshal that year was another one of my heroes of all time, Buzz Aldrin. Buzz was the second man on the moon, and he was the Grand Marshal for one of the uh, Michigan Grand Prix and. I was standing there talking to him, and somebody says, hey, Ron. And I looked up, and they took the picture, and later on sent it to me. That's pretty great. Man that was in outer space and went a lot faster in these race cars. Mm -hmm. This was 2002. Andy Granatelli uh, is presenting me on uh, driver's uh, day that uh, they, they give the instructions to the drivers in front of several fans. I was presented with the Unsung Hero Award, a beautiful ring that Andy presented every year to somebody behind the scenes. And what was his role? Uh, he was a car owner. He's actually in Mario Andretti's winning car. Uh, he owned that car in 69 and owned several cars throughout the years on the turbine. Okay. And he was actually a driver back in... Uh, the 40s. I was in Long Beach and I was going uh, to the Marlboro trailer to eat lunch. And Emerson Fittipaldi called me over and he says, Ron, this gentleman would like to talk to you about getting a uh, uh, pass for the Speedway to shoot pictures. And I said, well, uh, okay. And I introduced myself and he looked at me and he says, I'm George Harrison of the Beatles. Also, of the, so what went through your head when you realized you were talking to a Beatle? Well, having been around celebrities for most of my life, my next door neighbor was a Indian Indianapolis celebrity, so I was used to seeing major celebrities over at his house, and uh, I wasn't starstruck. Let's put it that way. I treated him like. I wanted to be treated and didn't treat them like celebrities. Right. So let's get a close up I, shot of George Harrison and yourself and Emerson Fittipaldi. Now, when I was talking to George, I said, Now, what we'll do if you don't want to be inundated with people, because that's the biggest uh, sporting event uh, in the world with more photographers, more fans than any one day sporting event. So if you don't want to be recognized, I'll make you a name tag and put you on my staff, make you a name tag, and it'll be a fictitious name. And it'll be your choice of names. You can tell people who you are or admit who you are, or if people don't recognize you, you don't have to bring it up if you don't want to. He said, that's the name. great. So... Uh, he said he'd contact me later. I gave him my business card. He'd contact me later. The next race, uh, which was, been, I think, 1990 or 91, uh, when he was going to show up at the racetrack, uh, he was supposed to call me, and I was going to tell him all the details and where to get his credential and, and uh, what name to use. And uh, something came up with the traveling Wilburys, that he was either in a recording session or something, and he died shortly thereafter, maybe a year later. So he never get, got to, to fulfill what he wanted me to do for him, wow. unfortunately. But I did get to meet him, and that was a, a big thrill. If you look at the uh, grin on your face, you look extremely happy at that well, second. Fittipaldi and I are discussing uh, before I even knew who he was, because uh, I didn't recognize him being a, a rock and roll fan and a Beatles fan and knowing having every Beatles record that ever came out, an album. Uh, he didn't, first of all, he's in sunglasses and a hat. 
he was a lot older than I remember seeing him. And uh, so I, I didn't initially know who it was. And Emerson says, I got somebody I want you to get a photo pass for. And that was the expression that I came up with when Emerson said that. Well, this is a shot of Emerson on his private jet that you're taking the photo. Is that right? That's Ari Leindyke. Oh, I'm sorry. It's Ari Leindyke. And after, the, after he won his second Indy 500 in 1997, uh, we took him to uh, New York, Texas, Milwaukee, and uh, had different interviews on, on TV shows and, and uh, radio shows and things like that uh, before the, the upcoming races at Texas and Milwaukee right after the 500. Uh, we got on one of uh, the Holman family, Holman George family's private jets, private jetted to New York, Texas. And all this was done in a two or three day period after each 500 wow. for several years. Go. In the middle 80s, and I can't really give you, in the middle 80s, uh, one of my race driver friends, uh, Dominic Dodson, was uh, in the pits and he called me over. He says, would you kind of show this guy around? And as we walked down the pits, somebody else took a picture of me and sent it to me. And he says, this is uh, Joe Walsh of the Eagles. So being familiar with rock and roll and, and uh, the Eagles being one of my favorite bands, I escorted uh, Joe Walsh down the pit area and introduced him to a few drivers as well as Dominic did, and uh, we talked about some of the race cars and what went on at the Speedway and my job. Okay, and this is in, I believe, 2009, 2008, somewhere in that era with uh, me in the pit area uh, with Tony Stewart and A.J. Foyt. Two legends, opposite sides of the track, literally. That's amazing. Yeah. And uh, so this is Jim Garner? Jim Garner and, and myself in the pit area. And this was probably in 78, 79, somewhere in that era. All right. Mm -hmm. This was a gentleman from Australia that in Indiana, he started a, uh, a Australian animal farm. And... Uh, he happened to be a fan of pictures, so he came in the trackside office one time and went through pictures, and I introduced myself and got to know him a little bit. And next time I saw him, he brings in a kangaroo. And through the years that he was coming to the Speedway, he brought in a, uh, this is actually a wallaby, not a kangaroo, but some, same species, similar species. He brought a koala bear, kangaroo. Uh, I think he brought in a couple of birds, which I, uh, didn't have pictures of, and we remained friends throughout his time in Indiana. So how long did it take for the uh, kangaroo to get around the track? <laughs> I don't think he was allowed to go around the track. Matter of fact, this was taken in the garage area, and the person that was the head of security wasn't too fond of animals in the pit area, garage area, or really. Well, there's the chance of them having to go to the bathroom and somebody have to yeah. pick that up, right? Mm -hmm. That's probably when we care about the kangaroo. And, and this guy was pretty good kangaroo about doing, doing stuff like that, mm -hmm. making sure that uh, the animals stayed, uh, their area stayed clean after they left. Okay. So we were just talking about animals and we just, I want, I want to see a little bit of history, maybe something going sideways with animals at the track. What, what would be something that stands out? Well, I've got a couple of stories. First of all, uh, not at the track, but at when we went to Australia for the, the first IndyCar race in Australia in 1990. Uh, on one of the days off that we had in Australia, uh, we went to um, a, an animal refugee, I guess, uh, where they, they had several animals. And it was a place where the animals weren't in cages. They were right along beside you. And I got to walk amongst kangaroos, wallabies, uh, emus, 
Now, emus, if you don't know, they're a bird about like an ostrich and about this tall and fast. And you're walking along an area that's just a, a grassy area, and all of a sudden here comes a kangaroo or a kangaroo on one side and an emu on the other side. And if you don't know the ostriches and emus, they can be mean. So we're told not to not to mess with them, but you can let them walk alongside you if you dare. You see, you never rode so, one. No, never rode one. <laughs> All right. Uh, at that time, I, uh, I'm about three years after a uh, new operation to fuse my ankle uh, after my motorcycle accident in uh, 78, 13 years later. I'm in Australia and I'm, you know, after doing all this, I, one other thing I want to do was bungee jump. So in Australia, you go up on a big crane to bungee jump and go off of the platform, off of this crane and down to a river. And you hope you don't stretch far enough to go into the river. And they've supposedly got it done so well and they tie you up around your ankles and you jump off and and go down into this ravine and river and my doctor terry trammell found out i was going to do this as soon after he had just fused my ankle he says no because what's going to happen is when it's you get yank down you there, apart that ankle will pull apart yeah and you'll hit whatever's on the ground so i was uh, refused from going bungee jumping in Australia. I think that's probably a good call. One of the mechanics that was with me decided he was going to do it. He went up and he bungee jumped naked. Buck naked. <laughs> and somewhere in the IMS archives or uh, some archives that it ended up in racing is this Mechanic jumping off of bungee jumping naked. Wow. I did not get a picture of that. Well, what I wanted. Probably better from the back. Yeah. <laughs> this was at uh, Atlanta. And, and you're in your race field, at right? Atlanta. And uh, we, uh, again, I was shooting the celebrity flag waver at an IndyCar race. And uh, it was a Vander Hallfield. World champ boxer. World champ him. I shot. Uh, of the boxing world, I got to shoot a Vander. I got to shoot uh, Muhammad Ali at the Speedway and uh, George Foreman. Wow. Sugar Ray Leonard was a flag waver on our uh, IndyCar stage. And then here we got a shot. I think you alluded to earlier, but with Al Unser Jr. Al Unser Jr. grabbed my camera. We're out in the pits and we're talking, and he decides he wants to look into grandstands and find one of the pretty girls. So he got my camera, and I think at that time I had a 600-millimeter lens on. And so what's the magnification from normal? Like, what is that equal uh, to? You're up close and personal from there to the grandstand. You're, yeah. You're getting close. Okay. We got Dan Weldon, God rest his soul. But go ahead and talk about this shot. This was a shot done for uh, a sponsor at the time was Ritmo Watch. And as you can see, the three drivers, Dan Weldon, Milka Duno, Elio Castor Neves, are holding the watch up uh, and showing off the watch. Wow. So Indianapolis Racers was the hockey team. Who is, the, who is this gentleman? This gentleman was a big radio announcer uh, on a news talk sports radio that showed up. Uh, also a big TV star later on in life, and that's David Letterman. That was that's the, David Letterman? That's one of the first pictures that anybody ever got of him with his beard. Wow. That is, you know, he was my uh, father's paper boy, and they had cotillion <laughs> class together. <laughs> and he was a Simakai at Ball State, and we were uh, right across the street. But go on. Nashville Speedway, the oval racetrack. Uh, again, we got to go there early enough that uh, well, you're looking at Paul Newman. Right yeah. Now. But uh, so the this, other one is over there is, is me on stage at the Grand Ole Opry 
not really playing a guitar. But uh, and then here we got a shot of Paul Newman. Yep. Newman Haas Racing. Paul was fine as long as you didn't talk to him about movies when he was at a racetrack. He right. was a great race driver. Uh, I shot several shots of him uh, in race cars in the Trans Am series back in the early days, uh, in the 70s when I was getting started. And uh, How about this with the uh, cowboy hats? What's going on here? There again, back in the early days, we used to uh, have a fun... Fun day. We had Hawaiian shirt days. We had crazy hat days. Uh, and me and another guy that was working on my staff that sometimes came up and shot uh, shots of the uh, qualifiers. That's pretty neat. That's, Go ahead, yeah. That's a shot from uh, Chicagoland Speedway. Those three cars are crossing for the win of the race, and it looks like Tony Kanaan won that race. I had one shot to get that. I couldn't see the cars coming because the two flags were being waved. So I had to listen until the cars got were at a point where I could, my brain would tell me to shoot it and they'd be on the start finish line. All right, let's talk about the bricks getting redone here. The bricks were redone in 2010, I believe. And, uh, when I was out there taking pictures of them redoing the bricks, he says, do you want to place a brick? I said, well, sure. So the guy doing the brick laying took my camera and I placed a brick. And so I, I don't know if those bricks are still there, but I'm assuming they are. Right. Uh, I placed one of the bricks on the start finish line. You were able to branch out from racing and just kind of speak to what you were just saying. Yeah, I, uh, because of my job in racing and, and meeting a lot of people, the PR director for the Pacers hired me to shoot Pacer games at home. And they introduced me to the racers organization, which just came to town. And I was shooting hockey, basketball, along with racing. And in doing so, one of the celebrity games that they had before the thing this guy comes out and I knew Dave from from uh, TV and, and he was a weatherman on Channel 13 uh, and I had met him once or twice and he comes out and I didn't recognize who that was and I asked somebody I said who's that out there on the ice in the celebrity game I said that's David Letterman I said no that's not David Letterman so I shot that picture of Dave and later on when he had his uh, TV show national show i sent a copy of that and uh, they were going to put it on the air i never got to see the show uh, that they put on the air so i don't know whether they did it or not but uh, that was a that's pretty amazing deal. i also shot uh, world team tennis uh, along with hockey and and basketball baseball the indianapolis indians uh, I've also shot several different uh, race drivers throwing the first ball out after winning the Indy 500 at uh, Shea Stadium, Yankee Stadium, uh, Cincinnati, St. Louis, and probably ones I've forgotten over the years. Wow. When the Indy Racing League was first forming in, in uh, 1994, our first race was 1996. And in 1997, uh, in Orlando at Walt Disney World, I heard that there was going to be a shuttle launch on one of the nights. It was actually about two o'clock in the morning. They were going to launch one of the shuttles. So I set my alarm, got up at uh, O'Dark 30 and got in the car and drove the, uh, two hours over to the coast and uh, as I got to the coast, I had, of course, I had a camera with me and big long lens and uh, went to somebody recommend I go to the Astronaut Hall of Fame. So I go in the Astronaut Hall of Fame and I give one of the uh, docents my business card and I said, where can I get a good shot of the shuttle going up? I've got this long lens and I'd like to take a shuttle picture. How close can I get? He says, well, you're about eight miles away, but you can shoot it from our roof. 
So I went up to the roof of the Astronaut Hall of Fame and shot that picture with a 500 millimeter lens uh, of the shuttle going up. That's amazing. How did that sound? Uh, you know, there was no sound when the first uh, flames came on and, uh, and started to take off. And about oh, 30 seconds later, the sound hits you. So you were that far away, it took 30 seconds to hit 30 you? 30 seconds or so to hit me. I don't remember exactly how long. Wow. It was It was not instantaneous. Wow. And then the sound. And then he felt the shock wave. Right. It wasn't a strong shock wave, but at eight miles away and up on a roof that uh, there were, I think, five or six of us up on the roof. Wow, that's amazing. All right, so this is one of the original cameras used at the Speedway, or what, what was the backstory of well, this? Well, I used this camera uh, when I first took over in 72. And in 73, I made a deal with Sinar who was a Nikon subsidiary to this, this camera was 1950s vintage and it was used by Bud Jones, the photographer, chief photographer in the fifties. And uh, I'm not sure that it wasn't his camera, but it was left at the speedway when we got done using it and we went to a, a higher grade camera, uh, we, the speedway was going to junk it. And I said, I'd like to have that for my camera collection. So what year do you think, how old do you think this is? It's probably like early 50s, 50, yeah. 52, something 50. like that. That's amazing. Yeah. Go. Tony Bettenhausen, is that who is on this golf club? Yes. Uh, Tony and I have been friends for as long as he's been in the, uh, uh, at the Speedway. And, uh, he had the, the, Ping was one of his sponsors on his race car for several years. And I think each year or every other year, they would send him a new set of clubs. And he listed these for sale at the Speedway one day, uh, was trying to sell the clubs, uh, an old set of clubs. And uh, so it's got everything except the woods, right? Right. And so Tony and I, uh, we were great friends, but he was anti IRL, anti racing league, and pro cart. And of course, when the uh, split came in in '96, uh, Tony and I would get together and we'd promise each other we're, we're going to talk about the 500 or anti racing league versus cart. We were going to be friends and and just discuss friendship and and other things like that. Five minutes later, it was he was anti IRL, I was pro IRL, so we get in a big argument, and we were sitting in a uh, restaurant one night, and I said, Tony, I'll tell you what, he he kept saying the IRL was never going to happen, the first race was never going to happen at Disney World. I said, Tony, I'll tell you what, I'll bet you double what you want for your golf clubs or a thousand dollars against IRL race, first race happening and being successful. And I get those clubs. He says, you're on because that race is never going to happen. So we parted ways. And of course the first IRL race came off and was successful as well as Phoenix. And I think Las Vegas, the third race. And so I, next time I saw Tony, now Tony was off racing cart and I was off racing uh, IRL at the time. And uh, so the next time I saw Tony, it was about a year later. He called me and he says, Ron, can you shoot a, a little golf tournament I'm having and uh, at the Country Club of Indianapolis? I said, yeah, if, if I get the golf clubs that I won from you for that race coming off, oh, I'll, I'll give you your golf clubs. So. He gave me the golf clubs at that event I was shooting for him. He just gave them to me loose, wrapped up all. Uh, and you already had this bag, 10 or 12 right? clubs, and I had this bag. This was a bag that I occasionally used. Uh, being on the road with IRL and working full time for the Speedway, I rarely got a chance to use them. But uh, the first thing I did when I got these clubs and I came home, 
took all the clubs out of my bag, put them, put his Tony Bettenhausen's clubs in my IRL bag, took a picture of it, and sent it to him. That's great. Uh -huh. Okay, so let's start from over here. This is the uh, certificate of appreciation for Ron McQueenie, the Unser Racing Museum. So this is right. Albuquerque. When, when uh, Al and uh, his wife started the museum, they leaned on me for photographs of Al's career and uh, some other memorabilia. And I loaned some stuff to them and they uh, gave them pictures for the museum. And then and you've got the... Uh, I got that in the mail. Uh, this is the United there States I did Auto Club. a lot of Club. pictures uh, while United States Auto Club was a part of the Speedway up until, until 97, 98. Uh, I did a lot of photos for them if they needed something uh, photographically and their photographer wasn't available, I would go to them and uh, take the picture for them. It's American Auto Racing Riders and Broadcast Association. Yeah, that was an award that I won uh, in 2006, uh, Straight Shooters Award. And that was for uh, all the things I've done in photography. Past President's Award 2015, That what was that uh, related to? Okay, in uh, 2015, I was elected to the, uh, uh, I was on the board of directors for the uh, uh, Annapolis 500 Old Timers. And... Uh, elected a second term in 2017, elected a third term in 2023. And now you're back. I'm the, yeah, I'm the only three-time, actually only two-time and three-time president of the association. Wow. Uh, back in 93, I was uh, given this before I was on the board. I was, uh, that's the Clarence Cagle Award that the old timers give out. Okay. And those, then we have a couple pins up here. Okay, those things are uh, uh, lap prize donor awards and I found those at a flea market, at one of the Speedway flea market. And then what about yeah, this old one that's got a lot of signatures on it? Something I found at a, uh, again, at a antique mall and thought it was neat and bought it. Uh, at the John Andretti race for Riley, I did that every year from, well, I did it for 25 years. And uh, at their uh, appreciation dinner, I was able to acquire this Andretti wine bottle full. We don't drink here. So all my wine bottles that I have are, are uh, basically uh, show pieces. This is this Mario sent me. John sent me those two one year, and I got this at an auction uh, at John Andretti's Race for Riley. And this is signed by Mario, Michael, Marco, John, Aldo, and Jarrett. There's six signatures on there. All the Andretti. That's pretty amazing. All the racing Andretti. Let, let's anyway. let's get the. Uh, you've got some fuzzy Zellers over here. Those are commemorative bottles that came out in. Uh, this from the two thousands. Force Wine Vault. Those are Ford bottles that I've acquired. And what is this? Okay, that's uh, my prize award is the Indianapolis Old Timers have one major award that they give out at their banquet once a year. And that was in 2003, I believe, 2000, no, 2013, uh, the Louis Meyer Award. And Louis being a friend from the older days, uh, it meant a lot to me. And that was their... Uh, it's for uh, lifetime achievement in, at the end of Indianapolis 500. That's beautiful. And then here's, let's call it the final wall. Is there uh, well, this any is, particular Well, this is my Corvette wall. 
The Corvette. Uh, I've been a Corvette fan since as long as Corvettes have been made. Uh, I own my first Corvette was. And that's Tony Holman, right? That's Tony Holman. My first Corvette was this 95 bright yellow. My next Corvette was a brand new silver anniversary. This was a 72 that I bought when I had, after I had my motorcycle accident, I ordered a new motorcycle. And Dr. Trammell says, no, you can't hold up a bike like that, at least this early. So I went back and I, when I got my new motorcycle and was told I couldn't use it anymore, I went back and, and Junior Dreyer, who I bought all my motorcycles from, said, well, I got a car you'd like to have. How about this 72 Corvette that I just rebuilt? Uh, fine. And this shot right here? This shot right here, a uh, magazine article uh, from uh, 2009. They had me drive my car in, and of course I could go out on the racetrack anytime I wanted to as long as I stayed at 50 mile an hour or below. And they did a... a five or six page magazine article about uh, the eyes of the speedway or at home in the brickyard, this was called. That's a nice lineup of multiple versions for multiple years. Each year that we had a Corvette while, while I was uh, in the employ of the speedway, each year we had Corvette as a pace car. I went to uh, figure out how I was going to set up all the pace cars in the museum. We have all the pace cars from 72 on. And uh, so we had all those Corvettes. So I was going to uh, figure out a way to take, there's the first time I put two pace cars together in 86, the 78 and 86 pace car. And then uh, another time I did seven, I think of them. And there's 10. Uh, here's seven, so that might be eight, seven or eight, I don't know. Uh, this particular one is at the Corvette Museum in Bowling Green, and we, that's Emerson Fittipaldi, the pace car driver that year, and we got to go through the line as they were building several of these replica Corvettes and they had one already done and we uh, took put Emerson out in front of the museum and took, took pictures of that at the Corvette Museum. But uh, it was a rare occasion that I got to take a camera into uh, the, the building of a Corvette. That's amazing. So I, I just noticed over here a lot of bobbleheads of drivers. Oh yeah, I this always went. This is great. Every time a bobblehead came out, I went down the. You got Al Unser, AJ Foyt, Rick Mears here at the top. Yep. Castro Neves. Ward, Warner Trophy, Castro Neves. Look at all these. <laughs> yep. These are great. These are phenomenal. I have. Do you have a favorite one? Yeah. See, most of these people in these, these bobbleheads were friends. And now uh, if you look at the Tom Carnegie one that's one in the center with the hat. Uh, push a button and it gives his three or four uh, famous speeches and uh, he's slowing down on the back stretch. It's a new track record and fans, you're not going to believe this. <laughs> The key quotes. And then what is this book? Uh, that's a Corvette book. You look at all the, this is all part of my Corvette collection and and uh, every book I could get my hands on from uh, stuff. I, I make speeches at the uh, Mid-America uh, Design in uh, Effingham, Illinois every year talk about my 40 years at the Speedway and the uh, pace cars at the Speedway, because I'm usually the first one to get to see outside of Chevrolet, get to see a pace car and they bring it in under secrecy. I take it out on the racetrack, have about two hours shoot early, early in the morning. So nobody else is around. And so I get to shoot all this. And 
uh, in these books, almost every one of those books has at least one or two, maybe five pictures that I've taken, all credited to uh, either the Speedway or uh, to Chevrolet. But uh, at least I know that I was the only one taking them on that day. Well, Ron, this has been a pleasure seeing your road from victory lane to here of all these years. And you said it was 40 years, 40 races? 40 races, 40 years. Well, there was more than 40 races because we had... Well, 40 Indy 500s. 40 Indy 500s. 40 Indy 500s. Uh, before that, I saw every race except for the two years I was in the service from 56 up through the 2000 race. Okay. All right, we're going to close this session out, but this has been a beautiful voyage down memory lane and seeing all of the moments you were able to capture for the world, yeah. technically. Well, it's been a pleasure to be with you, and, and it was a labor of love. I, if I could have afforded it, I wouldn't have taken money to do this because it was just a, a great, great pleasure. Well, congratulations on a great career, being in charge of a lot of guys, making sure they got that shot right. Thank you. You got it.